what what is telling the authority to preach this message of repentance? Turn from your sins and turn towards God because the kingdom of God is near. It's a vital message. But by what authority does John thus prepare a pathway for the Lord's coming? Who is John? Is it that he was a rabbi's son and that his papa was visited by an angel and he was chosen by Lot, the game of chance, to burn the incense in the inner sanctuary of the temple? Luke begins his gospel reporting about Zechariah. When Zechariah was in the sanctuary, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, do not be afraid. Zechariah, God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must have never touched wine and other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the Lord, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who told me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until your child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. Just as a side note, God had not spoken through a prophet or a vision for 400 years. But still, do these circumstances of John's birth, circumstances around his birth, give John the authority to preach as he did? That the people should desire to hear him and respond to his words? Who do we give authority to like that? This is 30 years later, by the way. His parents, presume, are long dead. John's been living out there in the wilderness, and, and the gospel we read today from Matthew said that John's clothes were woven from camel hair, he wore a leather belt, and he ate locusts and walked with wild honey. I think the honey would be necessary to the locusts. But what is that all about? Well, for today, we'll set that aside for another sermon or Bible study. Today's lesson, let's observe that for those first century Jews seeking to worship faithfully the Lord God of their ancestors, John did have authority as one speaking significant, reliable truth, truth that confirmed the promises of God through the angels and through the prophets. Truth. Well, in my clergy text study this week, I expressed again, as I want to, my amazement that people were coming out to John in the wilderness. They went, seems to me, the great effort to go and hear him preach. And a fellow pastor said, you know, as I was telling you, know, why, why was that? What did Jesus, John have going on that the church doesn't have today? The fellow pastor said it was conspiracy theory. That's why he drew so many. I was a bit taken aback, and I asked him, 
Why is it that people are attracted to conspiracy theories? Isn't it because the established system no longer accomplishes what they were expected to do? To provide for the needs of the people? The promises that were made to them? The human need and desire for a positive relationship with God never ends. John the Baptizer is distinctly different from those other religious authorities, those we hear him denounce in today's reading. They seem to be, in John knew them, to be more interested in how important and superior they were thought to be in the eyes of others, more focused on themselves than nurturing a life-giving belief and trust in God's presence, God's prophecies. How God has addressed the problem of our sin and how God desired Israel to become a great nation to which others would know the God of heaven is among them and powerful and caring and providing for the least as well as the greatest. The people of God were not enjoying those blessings. They were not a nation that others were drawn to. They were under the oppressive thumb. They were subject to the Roman Empire. They were required to pay tax and tribute, which did not benefit them or their neighbors. What sort of future was there for their children? Many young people lost interest in the promise of God because they did not see, didn't see those promises being fulfilled. While the Pharisees and scribes and temple leaders protected their institutional interests, the ordinary people were waiting and watching for the Messiah, for God to act for them to restore things to his promise. Jesus, or the Messiah, the one promised by God to heal God's people, restore them to a life of blessed relationship with God and one another, to be united in faith by the presence of God with them, God showing his blessing. While we ponder John's authority and why some thought that he might be the Messiah, we know for sure that John, for him, the proof was in the pudding. The proof was in the doing, the repenting. As we think about what it is that gives someone authority, those people that have authority in our lives, isn't it have to do with the way they use their position, their wealth and authority to help others? what they do for others that makes them someone whose words we might consider significantly wise to teach and nurture us in faith, truth, service to God and one another. The authority and influence in this scene, and I don't think it believed belonged just to John. Authority, I believe, was also in the midst of those who were repenting of their sins and turning to a new and renewing relationship with the God of their ancestors. That very act of trusting God connected them to a power much greater than themselves. Repentance involves confession. And we find it's true. The confession is good for the soul, but we don't readily repent. It's something we don't openly do and certainly not sincerely without first experiencing the destructive weight of what it is that we need to give to God, to turn over to God and turn away from. But in order to do that, we also need to have in our imagination an image of God who is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. And that's not always the case. If one's understanding of God is as a distant entity, 
is likely to punish or extract penance as to forgive sins. That suppresses repentance. But if from the witness of believers like ourselves they come to trust and believe God's promise to remove their sins from His sight as far as the East is from the West, well then, there's a more hopefulness that God will be merciful and gracious and does want to put us back on a good, secure footing in His grace. So as we see and know what, what happens next, there's John in the wilderness and Jesus comes to him. Jesus came to John to be baptized. John who was waiting and watching for the Messiah. But Jesus did not come to borrow from John's authority or to use John's platform to begin his ministry. No, before Jesus would begin his ministry, he would spend 40 days in the wilderness by himself and be tested. Jesus' presence and desire to be baptized by John is all about solidarity with us, with ordinary people who seek a positive and renewed relationship with God, our ancestors. Jesus confirmed the good work that God was doing through John for the people of Israel, people from Jerusalem, Judea, and all around the Jordan River, which today for us would include people who cross our southern border seeking a better life for themselves and their families, people who are different from us in various ways, and people who've been lied to about Christianity in the world, and God willing, perhaps they can learn from us the true nature of God is mercy. Learn to trust the eternal truth of God's love. Perhaps you've heard of stories or experienced yourself, young people explaining their disinterest in God. Young adults say to their parents, you know, I, I, I learned a different way of looking at Christianity in high school when we started on social studies and world history. They taught us about Christianity and how the Crusaders went from Europe to the Eastern Mediterranean and conquered it, targeting, killing Muslims. About ruthless religious wars throughout Europe before and after the Reformation and while these things are true, they don't define Christianity. They're part of the story, but not the full story. Yet young people are presented with the wisdom of the Enlightenment, wisdom and understanding of how that perhaps put society in good order. Well, not all of that is in high school, some in college. And on the campus, I think we can imagine a young person may not want their friends to know they grew up in church, particularly when they hear professors say that church people don't really care about the poor and needy or they would have fixed that problem. To say Christians perpetuate systems of oppression and racism, they deny climate change, that a young person would want us to know that they don't want their friends to think that they've been brainwashed to hate people of color and condemn their queer friends. Even pressured to tell their parents to use gender inclusive pronouns, they and them. And they can say to us, what's well, in the podcast that we all listen to? It's even on the TV stations you watch. And if I don't, I'm not seen as sincere. And then after so confessing, it might ask you, how is it you can be so calm, happy, and hopeful as a believer in Christ? 
and they only be in commercials or Samaritan's Purse or Mercy Ships that they see a positive representation of Christian action. This world is not filling the minds of today's young people and our neighbors with positive ideas about the God that we worship and our faithfulness to the biblical values that Jesus demonstrated. And they ask, why should it matter? This baby born in a stable. But praise be to God, He's at work. Through the Holy Spirit, challenging them to test what they hear. Otherwise, they would think that hate and oppression is, is okay, but they don't. No, they know that that's wrong yet get swept away by lies so clever that they sound like truth, as we've been warned about in Ephesians 4, chapter 14. I recommend reading that entire chapter 4 of Ephesians about the church. Today's lesson from Romans 15, which gives hope for the church to be a united body of believers, patient and encouraging because God is gracious to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He has humbly born in a stable. And there's a lot to that story that God would go to that level for His Son to enter into human life. He did not come to condemn us in our sins, but forgive and empower us to be helpful and encouraging to neighbors and strangers in grace as God is merciful to all who repent and turn to God. So ponder this. Who in your life has had authority to speak to you about the loving power of God? His grace, His mercy. Come to us in that humble baby. What is it about your life, your words, and your deeds that points to your trust and belief in something greater than what is on the surface of this world? That God is actually pouring His goodness into this world through ordinary people like you and like God. As we are preparing for the second coming of Jesus through Advent, becoming knowledgeable of His first coming, His, his birth and ministry, His death and resurrection, new life following the coming of the Holy Spirit, we too need to be cautious of how we are blown about by every wind of new teaching, pressure to assimilate the cultural beliefs, how institutional self-interest and system, systems of thought undermine the foundation of the redeeming work of our Savior. Brings me to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we know that you are merciful and forgiving to those who turn from their sins and turn towards you and welcome the positive influence of your loving ways. May we remember that through our own baptism we have been joined to you, receiving new life, eternal life. Develop in us the hopeful perspective of love and humility to encourage family and neighbors to know that as you have forgiven us, they too can receive forgiveness and mercy from the one true God, humbly born in the stable, who will one day come again in glory. Lord, work in us the humble honesty of our need for your grace, that we may be ready on the day of your return. Amen. Let us pray for the world yearning for new hope. Holy God, 
you established your church throughout the world to proclaim the day of your coming. Make our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay ministers confident in their preaching that their words and our lives build up your church in love. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> With the turning of the seasons, we see that you have a plan for renewal of all that you have created. Abundance of harvest provides for the time of rest. Keep us attuned to the seasons we live in and guide us in the path of harmony with all you declare good. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the nations, cities, schools, businesses, and homes, make straighten the paths, level the mountains and hills, and make smooth the rough places. Prepare the hearts and minds of leaders to work on behalf of all people for truth, reconciliation, and justice. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine, Iran, and China. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Caring God, you have raised up people with gifts to care for those who suffer. Use our ministry and our lives to reach out with compassion to those who are hungry, oppressed, lonely, ill, and aging. Especially Ron, Pat and Howard, Jackie, Sally, Connie and Don, Marcin and Terry, Jane, Ruth, Grant them healing and wholeness, O God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You urge your people to welcome one another as you have welcomed us. Nurture ministries of hospitality and care in this and with our neighboring congregations. Instill in youth and elders alike a passion for pointing to your mercy everywhere that it's at its work. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have a welcoming embrace for everyone who turns to your mercy. We give thanks for the witnesses faithful to you as Lord throughout their lives. Sustain us in hope until we are united with them in the joy of your eternal presence. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing. You know already our deepest needs. By your Spirit, help us to offer all our lives to you, trusting full in the power of your love revealed through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> 